Namaste, Krishna Dandas here. Uh, recently, I published one book, Get Set Go, Students' Success Handbook, and it was published by Vishwakarma Publica Publications. And I am grateful and thankful, and feeling privileged to publish my book with them. Uh, the book talks about the five dimensions of success, mainly for students: their physical, mental, emotional, social. as well as academic aspect of success have been talked there in great details the vishwakarma publication team helped me in editing designing making an outline and as well as titling of the book and later on marketing it at various levels so i am very happy and satisfied with the team thank you Good evening and welcome back to Studio One. For this session, sharing limelight with animals, we are happy to have with us Janki Lennon, Pallavi Iyer, and Manjuri Prabhu. This session will be moderated by Sudapa Basu. Our first speaker, our first um, guest, Janki Lennon, a city girl gone feral. Janki Lennon is the author of two volumes of My Husband and Other Animals. The latest is Every Creature Has a Story, released in August 2020. She writes on a wide range of wildlife and conservation subjects for newspapers and magazines. She and her human partner share their home on the outskirts of Chennai with numerous pets and free-ranging wild creatures. Moving on to Pallavi Iyer. and award winning journalist pallavi iyer has worked as a foreign co correspondent for over 15 years reporting from china europe indonesia and japan she is a young global leader of the world economic forum she is the author of several books pallavi was a reuters fellow at oxford university and is the youngest winner of the prem bhatia memorial prize for political reporting for her dispatches from china pallavi is currently based in madrid spain from where she writes for international publications manjuri prabhu dr manjuri prabhu is an award winning international author and independent short film maker and also the founder director of two international festivals pune literary festival and international festival of spiritual india she has authored 16 books and is acknowledged as the first woman writer of mystery fiction in india a moderator for the session sutapa basu ms sutapa basu is a best selling author a poet author publishing professional her short stories have appeared in anthologies crossed and knotted defiant dreams when they spoke and rasha won the best fictional award by author awards her debut a psychological thriller dangle was nominated for the pilf anupam kher award for debut novels in 2017 I now request Sutapa Basu to take the session forward. Thank you. Let me welcome you to this session of PILF 2020 entitled Sharing Limelight with Animals. Very very intriguing title indeed. Uh, hi uh, Janki, Janki Lennon has been the author of several books about the animal world and Pallavi Iyer, hello. and her book jakarta tales is about the adventures of two cats and we are delighted to have with us manjuri prabhu who is not only a fervent animal activist but she is an author of thrillers but i think now she has decided to follow her favorite path and write about and she is about to launch a book which is about animal adventures and i am shrutapa basu i have also created a lot of animal characters for my short stories as well as my children's fiction now i think all of us at one time in our lives have suddenly realized that the animal world animals are integral to our lives 
let me tell you about my experience i was just about 6 or 7 years old when i suddenly observed that wherever i go whether there were dogs at home or on the street they would just come up to me wagging their tails with friendly sniffs and though my elders warned me that you know there could be fleas or there could be dog bites i would happily pet them and then they started following me everywhere that i went if they were told to if they were shut out or they were told to stop they would sit there with such sad expressions that i would feel sad as well and then i realized that i could communicate with them you know whenever i spoke to them they would reciprocate and then this communication went further to animals like you know birds or squirrels and soon my husband and my children would be embarrassed because i would be you know <clears throat> talk to these animals as if they were my friends or acquaintances and so when i started writing stories it was just natural that i would have a uh, my animal characters would definitely share the limelight with my human protagonists so i have you know people like i have things like creatures like crows uh, creatures like dinosaurs or earthworms who populate my stories so that is my story now what is your story what inspired you to pick up writing about animals and their worlds manjini will you go first yes yeah, sure um Well, so I've grown up amongst animals. I mean, not like Janaki, not in the wild. I mean, uh, the wild is almost at a doorstep, I think. Uh, yeah, but yes, dogs and cats have been a very, very important part of my life, and uh, I grew up amongst them. And uh, I'm really surprised, but I love dogs sometimes more than cats. But cats are who really feature in my books, and I don't know why this has happened. And now that I think of it, I'm wondering why. <laughs> I've just realized that I have more cats than dogs. But yes, it's uh, well. I've learned so much from dogs all my life, and uh, from animals. And like you said, you talk to animals. So, so do I. and i feel an instant connect with animals more than with human beings and i feel they are an important part of my life so they have to be an important part of my my creative life too and that is why i brought them right into my life and i hope they stay in my creative space forever i'm sure they will <laughs> what about you janki you've done so much you know so much work <laughs> in this world okay it's a long story um it's also the story of my life So I grew up in the city and I didn't have any animal adventures that I can relate. Um my family had cats, but as you know from your experience, they're very independent creatures and they are not very um what do you say given to bonding with you so much. Okay. So they were just really um they would come and go as they please, so I didn't develop any affection for them in that sense. but we had a garden and we had several trees in the city this is ages ago decades ago and i knew there were some kingfishers and woodpeckers and garden lizards but there was no one to actually uh tell me what these creatures were i would read books and i knew more about british birds and animals than anything in india or even madras where i grew up and uh, some of the books i read i really vicariously enjoyed animals through the books i read like uh, gerald darrell and you know blighton and stuff like that like that and uh, i even set up a bird feeder with uh, grain and was disappointed when crows and squirrels came and not great tits and warblers and things that i was reading about in the books and i remember being very disappointed i had no concept that these birds weren't even found in mars so it was really uh from having no contact with animals no avenues of exploring them that i um became a filmmaker and one of the first films i made was about this group of students who were walking the beaches of madras uh collecting sea turtle eggs and taking them to a hatchery to incubate them so that was the first time i really knew that there was a wild creature a large wild creature in a city and um from there i um met a group of people who were working on snake conservation and with them i went to the madras crocodile bank where i met rom but you know you know now that we are husband and wife but then he was uh, just somebody i looked up to 
And uh, he was also a filmmaker at that time. And uh, he wanted uh, a showreel. A showreel is like a, a collage of film snippets of stuff you've done to show film executives. So I was an editor. So he came to the studio. I was working in for me to edit it together. And he um, took it back to the, to the States to sell a story and... Uh, in the meantime, I was doing soaps and advertisements and really boring urban stuff. And when I finished a really stressful um, soap series, I needed time to um, recuperate. And a common friend of ours who was working with Rom on a film uh, said, why don't you come to the Croc Bank? And, uh, you know, we are filming rats. They are nocturnal animals, so we'll work at night, but we can hang out during the day. So I went off to the croc bank for R&R, &R, and uh, Anna would go off to the city so often and left me with Rom to entertain me. So poor chap, he had to take care of me, and he would show me reptiles of crocodiles and lizards and turtles. And so that's my entry into the animal world for the first time, really. But um, my entry to the wild took a few uh, months and it wasn't, I didn't enjoy it at all. There were leeches <laughs> and there was, you know, camping in the middle of the rain and the rainforest. It was just really, really awful and unpleasant. And for a long time, I thought, you know, th this isn't for me. And I almost gave up, but I kind of got over it. So that was my journey into this. It's not at all like you imagine. I didn't have pets. I didn't have the wild <laughs> from the word go. It all came later in life. What about you, Janki? I'm uh, sorry. Uh, what about you, Pallavi? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, there's two separate um, aspects to it. I always grew up uh, fascinated with animals. We had pets at home. And I think the very first ambition that I ever had was to be a veterinarian until I discovered that that involved uh, actually dealing with blood and guts and not just sort of cuddling animals, which is what I had imagined it to be. Um, and then my second ambition was to be a wildlife filmmaker. Janaki, hello. Uh, <laughs> ni neither of those two came to pass. But anyway, uh, I think it was a different moment where I would locate uh, animals kind of entering my uh, literary world and sort of impacting uh, on my adult life. And that really happened in about 2006 when I was living in uh, Beijing. And um, I was married, uh, newly married. My husband and I got married in 2005. And I was, uh, you know, uh, sort of getting to the age where I was beginning to think about having children. And I was terrified uh, by the idea of being a mother. And, uh, and, my, and my, you know, my husband and I felt very unpracticed and, uh, uh, and sort of ill-equipped to, to deal with the idea of parenthood. And so we decided that uh, we would do a practice run by, uh, by becoming the parents to cats before we uh, actually tried the human version. And uh, we decided on cats because we had been led to believe, and as Janki mentioned, but which turned out to be false advertising in our case, that cats were very independent and easy to take care of. Our cats turned out to be neither. <laughs> they're extremely, uh, um, they're, they're, they're like cogs, you know, we call them mixtures of cats and dogs because they have certain dog-like characteristics about them. But back in 2006, we put up advertisements saying that we wanted to adopt cats at our local vet, vet uh, veterinarian in uh, in Beijing and you know it ended up transforming our lives because um, not only did it bring the cats into our lives it also exposed us to a diverse um, uh, cross-section of Chinese society that had to do with animals that I hadn't known existed up to that point so the first cat tofu was what I call a dustbin cat. She'd been born um, as part of a, a litter that was in the backyard of an old professor at a university in northern Beijing. And I was taken to her by a, a, a cat protection society lady, uh, Mrs. Okay. Wang. And I ended up entering this whole, um, uh, you know, milieu of these uh, uh, animal rights activists in China who are very passionate and, and have a lot on their hands, actually. So that's where cat number one came from. 
around. Cat number two was a kind of middle class cat uh, that was born into a courtyard house in the old part of Beijing and um, uh, was um, given to me by a kindly old grandmother who used to look after all these cats. And both the grandmother, the cat protection lady, the old professor, they all eventually ended up becoming characters in my first book about the cats, which was called Chinese Whiskers, The Adventures of Soya Bean and Tofu. Okay. And um, and so, you know, that's how they kind of entered my uh, literary universe. But also I lived in a part of Beijing, uh, which was called the Hutongs, which were kind of which was kind of like an urban village. Um, and, um, you know, these were landscapes where animals were very much part of the streetscape. Um, you had tons of pet dogs, but you also had pigeons that were kept as, uh, as pets. You had um, Huang Shu Lang, which were a kind of urban yellow weasel that you could see sometimes uh, in the night, you know, just the silhouette of it over the rooftops. You mm -hmm. had obviously cats everywhere. And it fascinated me how um, these animals were kind of part of the human world, but at the same time of another world, you know, of their own world. And if you could kind of show it in a Venn diagram, they were like these intersecting parts. There was the animal world, the human world, and then, then this part where we came together. Um, and I thought that um, uh, that was a fascinating thing. Um, having the cats as pets also made me immediately aware about the fact that animals obviously do have an inner world and made me imagine how the world of humans might seem um, through their eyes. And, you know, if the work of a writer is to inhabit um, other minds, then in many ways, writing about animals and through the animal's eyes was, you know, a kind of ultimate act of imagination. So that was my story. Lovely. And I love that cogs. You know, that's a really new kind of an animal. Yes, cogs. I think they next time Manjiri, that's an inspiration to write about cogs now. Yeah. <laughs> so Manjiri, you know, when I see stray dogs on the streets, my feelings are often divided. Of course, on one hand, I would wish that they would have homes so that they don't have to forage for food or for shelter. But on the other hand, I also feel that they are very strong and independent creatures. Would they be able to stay in the restricted rules of a home? And you have been working very actively to find homes for strays. And today, keeping pets has become a fad. Many people, they may not be passionate about uh, animals and still they keep pets because it's a fashion. Do you think this kind of a situation has uh, given more homes to these strays? Okay, so since you mentioned uh, dogs, free dogs, and uh, kind of bringing them into our homes and getting them adjusted to a home life, well, I'm just now facing a similar situation. Okay, okay. I, there was this, uh, yeah, so there was this street dog uh, whom I used to feed uh, called Gattu. Uh, for many, many years I was feeding him, and then one day suddenly he vanished. I couldn't find him for a week. So I went looking for him. Then someone said, oh, you've seen Gattu under, there's a there's an ST stand next to my house. We've seen him there, you know. So I went looking for him. He was, somebody had hit him on his back and his, his hind legs were paralyzed. He couldn't move at all. So he was lying under the, and the bus. It had rained for three days. He couldn't move. He was in the water without food and anything. And when he saw me, he wagged his tail, just lying on the floor. So I brought him home and then I sent him to rescue, which is our, uh, you know, I sent him to the hospital and they treated him for 10 days and said, he's not going to survive. We should put him to sleep. Now that's something I don't believe. And I like to give every, I mean, I'm, I'm sure animal lovers will agree or not agree, but I like to give every dog his opportunity to live. So I brought him home and we, my husband and I treated him uh, you know, home treatment for a month and he started walking. Now, that's not where my problems began. My problems began where he can walk, but he's not independent enough. But in his mind, he thinks he can now go and live on the street because that's where he lived for eight years. So for my home uh, is a complete prison for him. So he'll wake me up in the middle of the night saying, I want to go down. He'll thrice in, in the night. And now, now I'm in a quandary whether to keep him in the house or let him go out in the street because that's where he thinks he belongs. So I agree with you on that, you know, in that context. But having said that, all these street dogs that you see at some point or the other, right in the beginning, were adopted by someone. Okay. They were somebody's pets and they were abandoned. So I that's why they're on the street. I think during the pandemic, yes. a lot of pets were abandoned also. Oh, yes. In one day, there were 30 pets abandoned in Mumbai itself. And if they couldn't abandon them, they were thrown from the terrace. And, they, you know, that's Imagine. the kind of mentality we have. 
Yeah, so so that's that's the kind of thing that happens. But uh, I think that every dog, every dog deserves to have a home, and uh, and that's what we work for also. That uh, if you adopt them at a young age, and you don't have to bring them into the house, you can just keep them in your uh, building, you know, apartment or in your garden or wherever. And uh, I'm a huge follower of Minka Gandhi, who believes that if every building adopts a street dog, there will be no street dogs on the road. True. But yes, during the pandemic, uh, there were two kinds of people: those who, you know, really felt that pets helped them through this crisis, and on the other hand, there were the rumor mongers and who believed in rumors and abandoned their pets. So you find all kinds of people. I hope that there'll be more people who understand the value of dogs in our lives or pets in our lives. And yeah, I'm just going to keep hoping that that happens. So basically, when uh, these uh, animals are rescued. We have to also keep in mind that every animal is an individual and may have individual Absolutely. needs. And accordingly, we should, I mean, whoever rescues them, keeps them in a the house yes. or in the compound or in the building, yeah. should also keep that yeah. in mind. You know, you can't have one rule for you. No, they have very so strong personalities. They have strong Absolutely. personalities, Absolutely. and yes. yeah, and they will they will voice their opinion in many ways. You just need to listen to them. So you have to right. adapt. Yourself according to their needs. Yes, absolutely. I completely agree. Pallavi, your my next question is to you. Your book Jakarta Tales, as you pointed out, is actually your second book for children. So your first book, Chinese Whiskers, is set in Beijing, where you introduced your two cat protagonists, Tofu and Soya Bean. Now you have been writing as a journalist. You've been writing books about global issues like uh, you know pollution or migrants, and they're you know, mostly for adult audiences. What made you take up children's fiction? So, you know, most of my writing, as you mentioned, has been that of a foreign correspondent and therefore very much focused on reportage. But in many ways, it's been about finding a way of writing about other parts of the world. And I think um, when I started writing Chinese Whispers and then Jakarta Tales, there was a greater continuity uh, in that uh, uh, idea than you might imagine, which was to write about other parts of the world, but to make them accessible to readers who were not necessarily policy wonks, but um, you know just liked a good story. Um, and of trying to write stories that were very much set and situated in a particular geography that was other, that was not Indian, obviously, but through a story and themes that were simultaneously universal. So that was one. And then the other was that I also, you know, uh, in 2008, after the practice run of having the cats, we actually did end up having our own children. Um, the first one was born in 2008 uh, and the second a few years later. And, you know, I, of course, would tell them stories. Um, and stories that featured our cats were a great favorite with them. And then I considered my own history as a reader and I realized how important the stories that I had read um, when I was younger had been not just in firing my imagination, but in molding my values, you know, and all those values of plurality, diversity, of the importance of fighting the good fight. Those values were something that one got quite early on. Um, and, you know, it was really through the books um, that I read when I was a child and grew to love and the ones that stay with you through your life. And that got me also more interested um, in the idea of uh, reaching out to younger readers. But I was also sure that I, you know, I didn't really want to write with the idea of a child in my mind because I didn't want to talk down to them. What I really wanted was to write a good book um, that you know really anyone could enjoy. And I have to say that uh, the books have been very much marketed at both younger readers and adults um, to be read separately by them as groups, but also perhaps together. And um, and not just uh, you know to be read by Indians either. We've had translations of Chinese whiskers into um, Dutch and Italian, uh, and you know in the United States. Um, and that's been wonderful because you know here I am as an Indian writer writing about China and Indonesia. I think. 
think we have very little of that, you know, uh, space Absolutely. where Indians yes, write yes, about yes. other parts of the world and then are read by a third country. Um, so often we tend to be pigeonholed into Indians have to write about India or the immigrant experience. Um, so, yeah, I mean, in some ways the cats have allowed me to do that because, you know, the, <laughs> I'm writing through the cats, but they aren't people. So, you know, I think that frees me to be able to set them anywhere and, and tell the stories about different parts of the world. Um, so, yeah. So, so basically what you're saying is that when you have children, your world changes, your world view changes. And that's what actually happened to you. You realize that, you know, for children, it is necessary to write books, which would, uh, you know, tell them more about the world. You are absolutely Certainly. right on that. Yeah. More about the world, but at the same time about universal values. So I think that's Absolutely. quite important. You know, you write yes. about different parts of the world in different settings, but essentially right. these are values that get mirrored no matter where you are as important values that you want to develop at a young age, I think. True, true. Very true. Very true. Janki, my next question is comes to you. You know, many of my stories, they revolve completely in the animal world and there is no human being in sight at all. But yet I tend to give human voices and human traits to my animal characters. So most of us try to bring animals into the human world, but you take humans into the animal world. How do you do that? Okay, okay so <laughs> that's a tough question to answer. Um, so my background is filmmaking and I basically try to use things I know from that world, because I'm not trained to be a writer. I hadn't, um, I just picked it up by reading. One of the things that actors do is this, what they call method acting. So they inhabit the character to um, show you how that character feels and they portray that character as a very real um, person. And I try to do the same thing um, like, what does it feel to be like a chameleon, for instance? It looks mm -hmm. alien because each eye looks googly and it's oh, like looking yes. in different directions. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard for people to relate to a chameleon because it looks so different from anything that they know. And it's also, but I thought if I could show how wonderful it is, it might make them forget how weird it looks. So we like use our two eyes for depth perception whereas chameleons can do it with just one eye I mean, they can see the they just need to see with one eye to know where how far something is from them and they um have two different images feeding into their brain so how do their brains deal with this you know multitask essentially but in a to a degree greater than we are able to do so this is um, the sort of thing that I would like to deal with. Like, for instance, giraffes, like they have this long neck and then they have the problem of pumping blood to their brain from the heart, which is a good six feet away. So how do they do it against gravity and what are the problems that creates? So by the time a reader leaves an essay, I want them to get a sense of, that wonder about this creature, what makes it so special, how evolution has overcome a challenge, but that answer, the solution to the challenge might itself become uh, a challenge, like something else that the creature has overcome. But I don't know whether I succeed in doing that. I try, but, but it's just something that readers have to say whether it works or not. What I have read of your books, you definitely have been very, very successful. I mean, you know, you can just keep reading your books and, and you realize it's over. <laughs> like, you know, it's so absorbing. So definitely, you engage readers a lot by these unusual and extraordinary things about animals, which we are hardly aware of. So definitely you're doing a great job. No doubt about that, Jan. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Now, Pallavi, like you, I have also often used animal voices and views to reveal issues, you know, of pollution, conservation, yeah. and even human values like sharing, helping, racist attitudes. But I've always had to focus on one thing, which is whichever issue I promote, it must be within the familiar world of the child. I mean, at whatever age the child is. Now, I have written stories even for three-year-olds. So 
your books that feature the cat protagonists, soya bean and tofu and expose several social and political issues in um, china and indonesia have you ever worried that these issues might be a little too serious for the children who are going to read them or did you recast these issues so that they become more palatable and more comprehensible to the children what did you do yeah you know not really shutapa i have to say that the more childlike aspects of the novels are not because i think the intended reader is a child i didn't really have a age of the intended reader i wanted it to be as universal as possible so across age groups across nationalities i think the more childlike aspects really came from the fact that the protagonists themselves are cats and mm -hmm. uh, perforce somewhat innocent of the ways of humans or you know confused by them befuddled by them and in that sense they are closer to children who also face a considerable amount of bafflement as they learn to navigate a world that is designed by and inhabited by and seemingly made for adults but uh, ultimately you know i think the issues that i explore are uh, what's underlying all of them are uh, the values of diversity the importance of honesty and love and of inclusivity in the china book in chinese whiskers you know i bring this out because firstly of course the 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 people the the couple who have adopted the cats are foreigners they are not chinese so you immediately have that divide between foreigner and native they then have a helper in the house um auntie li who comes from the countryside and that deals with the kind of fault line between urbanites and people from the country which face a considerable amount of discrimination and then you have one of the cats um that gets rounded up by a vigilante gang you know so the cat the book is actually set um at some unidentifiable time before the olympic games in beijing so 2008 but i drew inspiration from the first corona virus from sars and so there's a virus that's going about in the city yes, yes. and mm -hmm. um and um you have these vigilante gangs that are blaming pets uh, cats and dogs as the source right. of the virus and are therefore rounding them up and you know on the streets and sort of taking them off to an untimely and gruesome death which is all based on real events by the way but in the, in the book one of the cats gets kidnapped in this way she eventually escapes and ends up then spending several months with a group of uh, construction workers migrant workers who are building the olympic game stadium so then again you have that fault line of um uh, you know workers from outside the migrant workers uh, on whose back these kind of glittering modern cities of beijing and shanghai were built so you know uh, i kind of uh, look at these fault lines consistently and in the messages um about how uh, actually ultimately people are the same and you know how these kinds of prejudices and biases that we have are wrong um and then you know similarly in the indonesia book in my new book jakarta tales uh, which are the continuing adventures of soya bean and tofu the major fault line is um that of different faiths we are looking at different religious re religions and uh, the cats end up getting involved in the fake news network that is being run by people of one particular faith to discredit people of another faith uh, um so you know i think these are very much my preoccupations and i think that these are book these are uh, uh issues that are of course important very much to adults today and as much to children today because we learn about how to think about these issues from a very young age so i didn't really feel worried that they would be too complex or difficult for children i think they are fully capable of grasping these i do tend to write like i said i don't try to write specifically for children so i often do have vocabulary that's quite difficult uh, uh my little one my 9 year old was reading jakarta tales recently we just got copies it's hot off the press um and he was rather upset because you know there was a one sentence in which the cat is talking about how his owners mr and mrs a have a proclivity for austerity and he was complaining and saying what is proclivity what is austerity and why do you use such difficult words and you know why didn't you think of me when you were writing the book and but you know i laughed and i said you know by the end of it you'll know what it is which is great and you know of course it's also you know a way of learning but i very much believe uh, that you know children don't have to understand every word in the book uh, uh they will learn from the context um, they will they will understand the story um we have wonderful illustrations uh, by aryama somaji a very talented um, illustrator which i think also helps bring them alive for a younger age group but i really do want these books to be universal kind of books and not just for kids i do think they really genuinely family reading and um that's where they're aimed and i think that all of the issues that they address um are issues that confront us 
young and old in today's world very nice i mean i i universally choose this what a lot of classic Uh, about like when I used to read Animal Farm by George Orwell or uh, Wind in the Willows by Kenneth Graham, I enjoyed them as a young person. But now, as an adult, I enjoy the ironical humor with which you know. So there are layers. Know, there are layers exactly, uh, and those layers. So it it should appeal to different age groups at different levels. I think that is uh, to some extent an attempt I've made. Yes. Yeah. So Manjiri, you know the book that you're going to launch. Have you also thought in these lines that you know the It's some. There's going to be something in the book which will make it absorbing for the child as well as for the grown up. So, have you done something like that? Yes, actually, I have. The book that's going to be launched is called The Adventures of Mitu, uh, who is a magical kitten. And uh, actually, you know, I'd written this book about I think 25 years ago, and it came as the single story in 12 issues of a children's newspaper. So even when I wrote it then, it did have a lot of spiritual elements in it. I mean, being with nature, loving animals, I think you can't help but be a little spiritual in nature, which is what I am. So, and you, I feel since you talked about values, it's. it's something i've always believed in giving in a you know a roundabout way so then i use this kitten mitu who's you know uh lives in homeland okay it's like heaven where everything is perfect and all and but mitu's too naughty for homeland so he's got too many human you know value too much of human how should i say too many human attributes uh, in him and so he's banished to manus land because uh, he's not fit to live in homeland and his punishment is that for all the bad deeds he's done he has to do enough good deeds in manus land so and only then can he return so this is where i in a way try to bring in a concept of karma you do good you you know kind of do a good but in a very different way and i think it's these are values which not just children need but adults need on a much larger scale than children Absolutely. because we can you know introduce children to values but what about the adults so i think through this book i hope like uh, pallavi said uh, i hope to target a lot of the universe okay and so that's what i've done but other than that <laughs> yeah i mean uh, well yeah so other than that i'm also bringing out a book uh, which is really very spiritual it's non fiction it's called the dog train of peace not the doctrine but the dog train of peace i personally believe that dogs whom we just take for granted whether they're on the streets in our home i believe that there's only one answer to peace in this world not one answer this one of the options of bringing peace into the world is through dogs and i've got lots of people interviewed in it of course but i do give a ninefold path like the sutras in the book and it's a it's a complete my life story in it and what i've learned from dogs and that's i hope that it will help some non animal lovers somewhere in this world and like i said inculcate some value system in this world yes so basically fiction non fiction but my goal is always to help society understand that there are ways of living other than what we are doing right now that's very interesting and manjiri yeah. is that book already launched is it released i would love to read it uh, no the metro book is going to be launched uh, probably this month i don't know i have to ask dipankar but the doctrine of peace would be probably february for my international spiritual festival Oh okay okay yeah. I'm going to be on it <laughs> definitely <laughs> Okay now uh, I think we've just got time for one last question So Janki you have been actively engaged in making people aware of you know conserving the uh, conserving the animal world their habitats and so on In what ways do you find that your efforts have actually brought a change in better conditions for animals and their habitats Okay so I'm not a conservationist I don't actually campaign for things. I only write about what I see. Um so the way I view conservation today is that the biggest threats to them are our government and corporates. So the our government likes to publicize tiger numbers when they go up every 2 years. but at the same time it's also destroying the very forest that tigers need so every 2 years also they have this um the state of our forest report which comes out and invariably our forests are increasing in number how i have no idea when they are actively denotifying them for you know creating 
um, industries or dams or whatever it is. So they count roadside trees and canopy of this percentage shade, something like that. It's like very creative accounting. It's not as if tigers and elephants can use these areas. So it's kind of, I think that's where our real challenge lies because nobody challenges the government or the corporates. And we are a willing participant in this. We like tigers, but they will almost become like our modern day totem animals. But this support is also sensitive because if you look at, say, for example, the Italian dam and over across the Dibang River in Arunachal Pradesh, it's going to submerge a tiger forest. And yes. the Mishmika community has been protesting it and there are other groups also protesting it. But there is really no widespread support in mainland India for it. So if we shed tears for tigers like we have that NDTV Save the Tiger campaign, but there is really no real change for their habitats. So we outrage when we see people rural people mistreating animals we sign online petitions we send letters to the prime minister and the minister of environment and forest but there really is a bias i would that i see among urban people because we see rural people as ignorant as intolerant as not knowing a thing about wildlife so we should go and educate them and raise awareness but a lot of urban people can't even live with a gecko, you know? You have insecticides that are advertised that kill geckos. And now we are going out and telling other people how to live with elephants and leopards in their backyard when we can't even do the live with some small little thing. So it, it's really a tough one to answer. So, you know, I look at whether the ethic of conservation whether it has improved over the decades, but it, it seems to get a lot more news headlines, but I'm not really sure if it works on the ground because for rural people, I see, I have a lot of empathy for what they go through. For them, it's a way of life. They don't have a choice. If an elephant's going to come and take their crops, what can they do? They can chase it away one night, two nights, and the third night, they're going to fall asleep and the elephant's going to take their crops. And they go through this year after year after year. And then there are these urban people who sit, live far away from this reality saying, oh, these horrible people, they are you know, chasing elephants away and stuff like that. So I, I often wonder who needs more awareness raising? Is it people who live with these animals or people who don't, who live far away from them? And also, I guess um, a lot of our focus is on forests, on trees, and we don't look at landscapes where there are no trees, like grasslands. We have no, we don't value them. There are whole ranges, a whole range of creatures that live there that the government can't see. We are actively planting trees in those grasslands because of carbon sequestration or whatever, or soil conservation or some project comes in that completely destroys a natural habitat used by a whole like wolves like great indian busters which are really really endangered even more than tigers or even take our rivers like you know ganges is our holy river we worship the river but some of the recent images are like soap suds with one person's head yeah, popping up Yes, yes, yeah. we see it in Delhi. Mm -hmm. And there are creatures living there. There are gharials and, you know, river dolphins and a whole bunch of fish and turtles. So how do we even claim we are doing conservation when the state of our habitats is so bad? So I really don't have a straight answer. I can't say whether we are improving yeah. or not. It's just such a mixed bag, really. Was that a oh, I, answer you were looking for? No, I, I mean, I, I understand what you're saying and I completely empathize. But the thing is that the governments have to, you know, balance it. Basically, we, we talk about balance. So that is the balance that they should be seeking and not, you know, lean on one side or the other. 
which is you are very right that even the rural folk over there they need also you know they need some attention they i mean the government needs to focus on their livelihood and how they are dealing with these animals instead of you know central having it a sensation in, on the news that elephants have been uh, you know uh, you know fire uh, you know they have been like put on fire and things like that so uh, you are right about all that but uh, it's a big question and i don't know whether the very frankly whether the government is equipped actually to deal with it they're definitely not equipping themselves to deal with it so today i think this uh, session uh, you know writing books about animals or about children or for children or even for grown ups is actually a very very special skill it needs a certain kind of viewpoint and a certain kind of compassion because like pallavi pointed out they are actually observing the follies of whatever is happening in the human world and can we sort of show the world through their eyes that kind of writing really needs a special skill and uh, you know i remember that when the lockdown was happening in delhi during the pandemic i used to you know stand at my window and watch out uh, outside these birds the sparrows who were uh, bathing in rainwater puddles or i would see cats stalking squirrels and i was locked inside the room and i used to really envy them their freedom but then they earned it by fitting into the natural scheme of things which we did not so i think that is what we need to learn from the uh, from the pandemic and you know voices like manjri janki and pallavi all of you we need to listen to you and embrace the animal world basically i at least take away a lot from the session so uh, next time i'm going to start writing my animal story it will definitely be with a different viewpoint and much much more empathy and now i think uh, we are ready to take some audience questions can i have a question chaitanya anchor okay while we are waiting for the question uh, let me also talk, tell you about you know we were talking about oh, here's a question it's to pallavi in china anything that moves is food so is there a dichotomy of sorts you could see as an outsider in the love devour mentality what is the real scene there <laughs> yeah you know there's always been this famous saying that the chinese themselves have not about the chinese but about the cantonese so about people from guangdong and uh, hong kong um that they'll eat um anything with four legs except for a table and they'll eat anything that flies except for an aeroplane uh and this really comes from the chinese themselves it's a chinese thing um and yeah i mean certainly they're used to eating a more uh, diverse uh, range of um animals than people in many other parts of the world but i do think that um there's uh, absolutely zero wrong with that i mean if you eat animals if you're a, uh, a non vegetarian and you can eat this this and this not to eat this this and this you know can is is essentially just a cultural uh, difference it's not really about ethics at all um this i think the one thing that people go on about with the chinese is dogs yeah like this idea that they are they all eating dogs and um they do eat dogs i mean there's no there's no getting around that um particularly in the winter and not only just uh, the chinese but the koreans as well and and many japanese um, and Vietnam. also misos in india misos in, in india so you know it's considered to be a very warming food uh, for the winter it has a lot of fat in it i think which is why people um, eat it in soup uh, in the winter specifically but one thing that i found very interesting was that while people are eating dogs and all of that there's a huge amount of pet ownership a pet ownership was very much on the rise as well and under the communist revolution keeping pets was kind of frowned upon and I mean, almost banned it was seen as a kind of bourgeois habit that uh, you know real people of the salt uh, salt of the earth people didn't do um that's completely changed and i mean now you have like dog and cat cafes everywhere and people are sort of dressing up their dogs and pushing them around in prams and completely anthropomorphizing yeah. them <laughs> the huge change but what was interesting about the eating dogs was that i realized that chinese people um have a kind of dog that they eat and they see that dog as a very different type of animal to pet dogs so it's not as though they kind of you know have pets and then one fine day they decide to eat the pet i mean they would not do that as much as anyone else would not do that i mean their pets tend to be smaller you know the pekinese dog that we are, we know of it in india and nobody would eat a pekinese i mean they would never consider that food um instead they have bigger kind of dogs uh, they look a bit like our 
you know hindustani kuttas the kind of sort of uh, you know a mongrel breed which is a mongrel, medium yeah. sized med- medium mm-hmm. sized quite large and that mm-hmm. kind of dog is called a psycho which literally means vegetable dog it's food dog <laughs> Oh. And uh, and and psycho psycho actually features in my book Chinese Whiskers as well. When the cat, when Tofu gets kidnapped by the vigilantes, she's kept with a bunch of different dogs, and the leader of that gang of dogs is a psycho who's about to be eaten in any case. Uh, whether you know whether he gets killed by the vigilantes or he gets eaten up as the normal course of things, you know, he knows where his life is going. But um, but so the, but psychos are like they're actually almost like farmed. You know, you can go to. areas where they will be bred and then their food their food dogs their vegetable dogs <laughs> their food dogs so it's 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 different from the idea of eating a pet they really do see them as two very different categories of things but i think you know that's also changing and more and more people are becoming sort of urbanized and bourgeoisified or whatever and so there is a a strong uh, element in chinese society that's quite appalled at the idea of say eating dogs and you know more and more you see a lot of groups um that are that are beginning to think that this is a cultural practice that's unusually cruel and kind of you know uh, vociferous against that um so yeah i mean that's where it really goes with the chinese they also do have a sense in chinese culture that wild and exotic animals are prized that they are kind of status symbols and that there's also an idea sense that um what you eat influences the human body in a positive way in but in a very puerile way in the sense that you know you eat a i don't know tiger penis and you become very virile or you eat fish eyes and your eyesight improves or whatever this kind of direct connection between animals in the wild that have certain a certain prowess and the idea that if you then consume that that prowess somehow gets transferred to you um but that has been something that's again been there for long um, in chinese culture and um, and you know so you do have a lot more wildlife consumption i think in china than you do have in many other parts of the world because it's a uh, part of chinese medicine as well and this this idea that the animal world uh, sort of transfers um, medicinal and health benefits or whatever kind of benefits virility benefits um to human kind and i mean that's also one of the reasons why we have seen a lot of these viruses jumping from the animal world to human beings um in that part of the world um sars the corona virus in 2003 that makes an appearance in chinese whiskers um you know i think they eventually did locate it in civic civet cats which then unfortunately led to a lot of deaths of pet cats and dogs and kind of like what manjuri was saying about people throwing cats off terraces in bombay that did happen in chinese cities as well um where people were abandoning pets or murdering them themselves uh, because they felt scared uh, that they might be carriers of the virus um and then of course with the latest um uh, coronavirus covid um, we have theories that it originated in bats and pangolins somewhere it jumped mm-hmm. and the details of how and when and so on might be up for debate but it did jump from from uh, from wildlife so i do think that um, there's something to be learned from that i think you know about not overstepping certain bounds right well, well it's talking to okay. know about dogs being farmed but then if we look at turkeys no no all animals are, are farmed yeah, the chickens the battery chickens and yes. you know fish and yes. obviously yes. cows and yes. sheep and whatever absolutely for thanksgiving and christmas they are fattened so and then they are killed similarly uh, you know eid you have the goats which are again fattened yeah. and sold Yeah. So I think the, the the distaste for the idea of farming dogs to some extent is cultural, right? I mean, absolutely. Also, of absolutely. course, we do have dogs in the house, so we tend to form more anthropological bonds yes. with them. Yes. Yes. <laughs> That's yes. a part of the family. You hear this, right? But you know, this also stretches to the the wild world. I think what Janaki was saying earlier that we're also obsessed with tigers, and you know, not just tigers, but all kinds of charismatic megafauna i believe they are called big animals that have a charismatic value uh, versus say insects or you know ugly gnarled creatures <laughs> with funny eyes and nobody gives a, that much um, attention to so yeah we see that not only in in i think in the farmed world of food but also that kind of preference for certain over others or vilification of certain kinds of farming versus others but we also see it in our attitudes to wildlife conservation 
True. So I think I've constantly been warned that I have to finish the session. This has really, really very been a very engaging and very absorbing. Thank you so much, Janki, Pallavi, and Manjuri. Thank you very much. And a very good evening to all of you. Thank you so much, PILF uh, 2020, for having this session. It was very, very engaging. Thank you so much. Take care and a very good evening to all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this wonderful, heartwarming session. We are so sure our audience loved every bit of it. Please join us at 8 p.m. for yours truly, Martin Edwards. Thank you.